sixth grade, man, and I I would have killed to play in a high school choir because my brother was there and they hit bass player in town because we all lived in the same area. We all went to the same school. So yeah. The hit bass player was playing in there and my sister was singing, you know. Well, I mean, I, I couldn't wait to get into high school and I'll save you because I said, I'm going to be in, they called it TNR, which meant the New Revolution. Hmm. New Revelation, excuse me. And <laughs> <laughs> the New Revolution School, all right. The New, the new well, it was the TNR Gospel <laughs> Choir, so it was the, the New Revelation Choir. Yeah. And when I when I was a, when I was a freshman, man, they fired him. Wow, why? Uh, I think I think socially he was getting a little too heavy. You know, he 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 wore leather pants and leather jackets and didn't button his shirts up all the way. <laughs> a lot of the girls thought he was really attractive and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was a swinging he was a swinging kind of guy. Yeah. And I think people would really kill to get in his class and they would cut to go to choir early and you know he had that kind of effect on people. You know, and he did some things that weren't cool. A few things that weren't that were sort of against the grain with the with the school, but. I mean, he's an example to me of go for yours. Yeah. And that's what he did. He did it until they fired him. And when they fired him, he went out and did some other things and started his own organization. He had a little cable show, a little cable talent show. And right when I got with this band, because I, I didn't speak to him at all in college. I got out of school. I toured with Harry Belafonte. I didn't see him then. And right when Living Color started to make a name for itself, my sister saw him. And um, said, had heard that he was in the hospital, was doing too well. And he really he asked about me and stuff. And I came back from Europe again, and I already passed away. And he was just one of those kind of people that was in the right place at the right time for me. Mm -hmm. You know, because when I look back at those shows, I mean, I can't I can't tell you. I I wasn't into hanging out with any sixth graders. I, I wasn't. You couldn't get me. You know, I wasn't interested in any girls in my class. You know what I mean? I was just totally. I wanted to be down with that scene. That yeah. was that was it for me. That's I said, wow, this this was my biggest turn on. And he was the he was the guy that said, Calhoun, you're gonna have to learn how to play piano. To take piano lessons. You're gonna have to learn how to take play piano. You know, this drumming thing is cool. You gotta learn some theory, pal. So how yeah. when, how old were you when you started studying piano? Uh, I studied it as a kid. Yeah. Uh, I went to Bronx House music school which is on Tullamore Parkway in the Bronx I also went to camp at Bronx House mm -hmm. I remember, but I studied music theory and piano there it's in the Jewish community over there by Tullamore Parkway and it's, it's it's a great opportunity for me to check that out because my sister took ballet and one of my cousins studied violin and stuff so we were all in, into the whole classical thing yeah I'll tell you what turned me off about it I had this really strict Philippine teacher who was great Miss Acosta I'll never forget her who used to just crack my crack me over the hands with 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 the ruler when I when I when my technique was wrong or I used the wrong finger and I just told my mother like I can't. I remember one time <laughs> I was working very hard on this piece and I played it correctly and my ring finger was supposed to play like an A flat and I my pinky I played the piece perfect. Yeah. One of my fingers was wrong and she cracked me with the ruler. And I, I just snatched it out of her hand and cracked her back. It was a, it, <laughs> it was a uh, good for a you. Bad impulse, a natural just it just infuriated me. And she ran out of the room, man. She called my mom and she said, "Just fine, you know." Her mother laughed on the phone. She told me, of course, years later that she laughed. But um, that was the end of my piano lesson because I said, like, "Mom, you know, you know, you can crack me and it's okay." But she cracked me on, you know, I can't get it. I mean, I played the piece perfect. If you would have recorded. It, it sounded right. One finger was wrong. Just tell me, you know, she was very, very, but you know, I love this woman. You know, she did classical concerts and I would always ask her for front seats and I was always there. A hell of a player, serious technique, and she was very serious about what she did. And uh, I just found it too striking because she was Philippine, very, she was very little short woman and she played this massive piano and made it like <laughs> roar. Nine foot Steinway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Made the thing roar. So it wasn't a, a love-hate relationship kind of thing. I always liked the woman but I, did, I didn't like the way she taught. That's what I, I couldn't get next to. But I liked her. I never left the class. So, uh, Horace Arnold never hit you with a ruler, huh? No, no. no. <laughs> I would just say, you're not playing that right. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I even knew how to contact her because she would freak out and I don't play drums in a rock and roll band. She used to tell me, you know, you could be a concert pianist. You know, you have the attitude and you have the the uh, vibe to do it. You just have to assert yourself. So, so you learned enough through that in Berkeley. Then I mean, you wouldn't call yourself a pianist, you're, but you know, sir, you could sit yeah, down. Yeah, and, yeah. I wouldn't go on a gig and play keyboards. Okay. But I can, you know, write my own songs. And um, in Berkeley.
Ber- Berkeley was even better because I studied harmony. You know why certain chords work with other chords, and you learn about Indian scales and you know Mixolydian, yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. you learn about all these different scales and, <laughs> and, and Egyptian scales and things that you know. Some people say that sounds weird, but if you study the chord and the music, you understand why the flats and sharps change in certain scales. You know. Okay. Let's bring it up to date a little bit. Tell me about the Black Rock Coalition. Sure. They mention that in the uh, literature, but they don't tell much about it. Okay, the Black Rock Coalition is an organization of Vernon and one of his lawyer friends and a couple of his musician friends got together and and started simply because they were talking about music one day and they were realizing that they were having the same problem. They were playing in clubs in New York. No one was showing up. No one wanted to book the band. Record companies didn't want to sign the band. So they figured it was a great idea since we're all having the same problems. We should unite, start an organization, and make things happen for ourselves. Mm. Um, it's not a, a racist thing. It's not like there aren't any white people or Hispanics or Chinese or whatever in it. But it was basically labeled Black Rock Coalition because the majority of the musicians that were doing it at the time were playing rock and roll and were black. Yeah. And it's a black originated art form, and it sucks that people have to look at you weird for playing something that's part of your culture. Good point. That's the basis of it. The organization has grown. You know, it's, it's it's great. That's how I I met I met Vernon outside of that, but that was my first intake with the uh, people that I associate with now. I mean, the uh, attorney that I deal with now is out of the coalition. It's grown to to be a pretty big organization. We put on benefit concerts. We did a benefit for Otis Blackwell, which was great, and um, it was great to talk to him about the songs. He wrote for Elvis. And he never met Elvis, isn't that bizarre? He never met Elvis. Yeah. And how Elvis's organization treated him basically like shit. Did they? Yeah. And now, you know, he told us a story like he had to go up in, in the record company one day with a gun to get a royalty check. And he got it. <laughs> he did? Yep. He well, said, I guess so. You know, he, said, he, said, you know, he said, I thought they were going to call the cops and shoot me or kill me or whatever, but he said, I felt so degraded about this this music and the stuff that I was doing that I was going to go up there with the gun and if I wasn't if a check wasn't written to me he was like I was ready to deal with the consequences and he said he got his money yeah and, and, and that's a shame that he had to go through that to get something that was you know that was supposedly owed to him we've done big band concerts with people like Greg Osby and Steve Coleman. A lot, a lot of musicians in New York that are associated with the BRC. They may not attend meetings and stuff, but they're associated with it and they support it. Ronnie Drayton and a few other people. So it was great to, for me to get out of school and to be working with Harry and still have time off and come in and do shows with like John Paul Pirelli on guitar. Because I used to see Elvin as a teenager, as a young teenager, and John Paul played play with them for yeah. like five or six years. Yeah. And there I was on the same stage in rehearsal with John Paul. You know, for him it was like, oh, come on, man, get out of here. But that's what you got to understand. You know, I saw you guys religiously, you know, as a kid. So for me it was great to get in an organization like that. And that was another springboard for me to be around positive people who wanted to do their thing their way, who didn't want to sell out, who didn't want to necessarily put jerry curls in their hair or sing on these songs or write love songs or write about baby i need you tonight and you look sexy in that red dress and all that kind of stuff yeah i'm not swagging that music but to me sure you, are. You, shouldn't, you, shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to do that to make a living and it's the that's the other side of it where label people are so caught up in music and genres that they assume black people are one-dimensional mm-hmm. and we do rap and we do pop and mm-hmm. that's it you know, and you know, jazz is something that we do, but it's almost a forgotten language now. Yeah. So um, to play rock, it's like, huh? You know, why do you want to play that white music? You know what I mean? And it's 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 it's, it's sad. It's sad that that people think like that. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, part of it is the media and what's happening with rock and roll. I mean, if you were to walk up to a 13 year old kid and ask him, what does a rock singer look like to you? He'll, he'll say, oh, he's blind, he wears tall jeans, yeah. and, he, and he wings his microphone around, and he goes across <laughs> stage, and girls scream, yeah. you know, and that's the image, you know, mm-hmm. and I feel great that kids are plugged into this band, it's the greatest feeling, it's a great feeling for my little cousin to love this band, mm-hmm. to, 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 you know, I mean, he wants to be a doctor and all that, but the fact that he can look up to Vernon and say, wow, he's a guitar god, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, this guy, this guy really is, you know, it's, it's great, because when I grew up, Hendrix was my guitar god, you know what I mean? He checked that, I was like, yeah, Hendrix is like, wow, 
and it's great. And I don't, I'm not taking anything away from Steve Vai or, or Van Halen because those guys are amazing on their instrument. But it's not. That's not all. I'm not just saying that to make a black or white issue out of it. But um, more kids are plugged into that because for some people they feel like Steve Vai and Eddie Van Halen are more accessible to people, or they feel like they're easier to market than a Vernon Reed. And it's nice to know. It's <laughs> nice to know that um, our record did well, and kids are into it for what it is. Yeah. Because we have chicks in our video with uh, mini skirts on, and you know, sitting in the back seat of the car, licking our necks or yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're into it for what it is, and they're into the lyrics, and they're into the music, and they're into the power, of it, and they're into us doing it. Yeah. And that says a lot, man. That that, that that's a sign of something missing. You know, Tracy Chapman is a sign of something missing. This is bad great. Brains. I love Tracy Chapman. Tracy, yeah. Bad Brains, Fishbone, all of, all of that is, is, is an example. And um, people should really, really wake up because I feel like kids don't have an extreme today. Right? Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, I had, you know, Mahavish knew and that stuff was my extreme and straight ahead. I mean, you know, I went to Chaka Khan concerts and I went to see, you know, I still see Luther Vandross and stuff like that, but... There isn't any extreme for kids now. You either go see Metallica or Anthrax, or you go see Public Enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it for them. And that's why so many kids are hooked on those bands. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else that's really weird, and I'm surprised nobody's, nobody uh, in the media anyway has picked up on it. Why is, and there's two or three artists that have done this. I've seen Michael Jackson do it. I've seen Vanessa Williams do it. Uh, Gloria Estefan to a lesser extent. But why is Michael Jackson on the cover of Bad as white as I am? Yeah. And why is Vanessa Williams, I mean, if you see Vanessa Williams when she was Miss America and the way Vanessa Williams looks on the cover of her records, mm -hmm. why are they doing that? Yeah. That is, that is really out. I don't, I don't, I can't get into, like, Michael's personal life. Michael is <clears throat> hell of an artist. Yeah. And, you know, he's definitely a motherfucker. Yeah. Hands down. Really, I don't care because when I was a kid, I met this bass player. Um, he played with the monk. His name is Abdul Malik. Sure, yeah. I'm familiar with him. Yep. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and he was teaching at NYU. My folks wanted me to go to NYU, and I, and I went there to audition, and I made it. And he told my parents, you should really let your son go to Berkeley because he's just going to become a better musician at that school with his, mm. with his vibe. Yeah. And he sat me down in a room after my audition and said, I want to tell you some things. And he said, you know, chicks are going to try this. Your friends are going to try to bring you down. Everything he told me in that room has already happened, and I'm sure it'll happen ten times over. One of the things he told me was, um, you know, about the whole sellout thing, mm -hmm. you know, and the whole thing dealing with the color issue and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why somebody would want to get a nose job, lighten their skin, <laughs> straighten their hair. You know, to me, yeah. to me, in these here times, especially as black Americans, yeah. you know, especially, um, I don't know why something like that would happen. I know I wouldn't allow it. I really would. That's my personal thing. Now, I'm not taking anything away from those artists, but you can't tell me we're going to sell more records if we get Jerry Carroll to lighten our skin. Yeah. You know, if yeah. white people are not going to dig it because we're black, then they're not going to dig it. Mm -hmm. I'm not into that whole trick of the trade kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was a cat that hit me to like all that stuff. And it's, it's, it's sad. It's really, really, really sad to, to um, think about. To, you know, I even saw Eddie Murphy's first album cover, and that sort of surprised me a little bit. The first record he did. Was he like that too? No, he's not like that. But it just, it just, it's, it sort of surprised me. I don't know if it was the lighting on it or what. It just caught me off guard a little bit. I was like, wait a minute, you know. And I think Denise, Willi I think it was Denise Williams, is the same thing. Those are the, those are the four people that. that... You know, well, the, it's, it's, see, it's, it's, it's kind of a weird thing, Denise. Is fair skin. Vanessa is fair skin. You know, a little, a little pot or a pie, whatever it is they're gonna put on themselves could could really change that. Yeah. And make you. Michael, to me, I, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to say about that because I was a Jackson Five fan when I was a kid. I think about, I mean, all of those guys were handsome guys. You know, they were all handsome, talented guys. But like I said, to each his own. Yeah. So it was necessary to do that. Then fine. But I don't, I don't see the the um the need to to sell myself on that or, or make it easier accessible to that and it's, it's frustrating to me because you know for you to be like a megastar and to be black and to set an example you know what I mean yeah. the, 
to me, the, the greatest thing you can do is to be yourself. That's the uh, that's the way people are going to respect you the most. I think on the next album, if we wore leather jackets and leather, you know, spandex pants <laughs> and had whips in our hands. Why don't you do it? You know, for the album um, Slick Love, people would say, what the, you know, they, the first the first flag would be they made some money and they're tripping. Now, they, <laughs> that's the first flag. Yeah. The first thing that would happen. Oh, Living Colors last record went platinum. They made some money and now they're doing this kind of thing. It's, it's just so frustrating to me. It's, you know, I, I would like to make the next album even raw than this one we just did. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for the point. I know when the, this Miss America just came, the AP Associated Press said, you know, she's the third black Miss America. I said, well, why did they do that? I was delighted when the girl herself just came out and said, that doesn't matter. I'm Miss America. There's a lot of shit going on today that just seems to be bringing that whole black white shit back. And I'm like, man, what, what in the world is going on? We get yeah, through all this, you know? It's a really, really sad sad thing but that's how some people just relate to things yeah. you know what I mean it's, that's how you know it's like my black friend my white friend yeah. you know what I mean and that's you know that's one of the things I just wrote a tune recently that, that, that we're doing as a matter of fact in the show now that um I'm pretty sure well, I don't want to say it but I'm, I'm assuming it will be on the next album so okay. sure everyone's into the song the producer's into the song and stuff and the song is called Pride and it deals with you know my experiences with being on the road and people asking us why we do what we do yeah. you know, and people wanting to touch Corey's hair you know and people wanting to burn and show me this lick and all of this kind of stuff but then what happens when the music stops and we're not on stage you know I still can't hail a cab Really? You still don't want me to live in your neighborhood. You know what I mean? I mean, these, to me, this is the reality of it. It's the reality of it. I mean, you know, Vernon, Vernon and I went to see Anthrax at the Felt Forum just right before they closed it. I think that was the last concert before they did renovations in there. We, we, we left, went downtown, get some sushi. After we had dinner, we split. He was going to Brooklyn. I was going back uptown. I told him, yeah, I'll check you later. He called me in the morning. He said, well, you know what happened to me last night when I left? Because kids started to mob and ask for autographs and stuff, and we signed autographs. And Vernon called me in the morning. He said, man, you know what happened to me last night? I said, what? He said, after we got out of the restaurant, I walked down the street, and some more kids were following me, asking for my autograph. I'm hailing a cab. Cab goes by, picks up this white lady on the corner. I signed some more autographs for these kids. Hail a cab. The cab does a U-turn. It's a white man across the street. And he said, and I realized, you know, I'm signing these autographs for these kids who are into, you know, the band and stuff. And the cab driver was take me to Brooklyn, and I'm already on the Lower East Side. Maybe it's a 10-minute ride. Yeah. You know, that's the reality of it. That's the things that, that you deal with. That's my reasoning for not wanting to change myself or change my look mm -hmm. or change my vibe about something like that because... No matter what, I mean, there's still places, Bill Cosby, Harry Belafonte, Whitney Houston, Eddie Murphy, Michael Jackson can't go in this country because of the color of their skin. Yeah. No matter how much money they make, no matter how much, how heavy their impact is on Pepsi or Coke or whatever it is they're selling Adidas or Nike, it doesn't change. It doesn't change. To me, it doesn't. The reality of it, when people start to accept people like people, that's when it's going to change. Not as the great black consumer, the great black banker, the great black business, or the big black enterprise, that, or the big white enterprise. You know, that's not, we're still where, where we were, to me, hundreds of years ago. To me. Do you think Manhattan, or I mean, especially now, all the crap that's been going down at Bensonhurst and all that other mess, and that the vibe in general is uh, worse in Manhattan than it might be, say, in Dubuque, Iowa, or a place like that? Uh, I'm beginning to believe that the North is getting worse than the South and the Midwest, because um, I've dealt with racism on, on all sides of the board. Yeah. I have family in the South, and it's like, if I go into a store and a white man vibes me, he's going to let me know. In the South? Yeah. Yep. In the north, he's going to smile at me and want me to buy something, or maybe even follow me around mm -hmm. and say, "Yeah, have a nice day." And when I leave, when I leave the store, you know, he may say something like, "Well, I hate when those kind of people come into my store," mm -hmm. you know. And that's the difference of it. But I think it's getting, it's definitely getting worse. But I also think people are starting to realize how far apart they are mm -hmm. from their reality. Part of that is the television set being in people's homes and they're not getting out. They're getting living in these small towns. And the only way, like, 
We talked to Mick Jagger, right? Yeah. We got the whole Brown Sugar song and some of his other stuff. Oh, yeah? Yeah, well, Great. yeah we did. Great. And um, Jagger, <coughs> Jagger um, talked about, as a kid, how his father made him watch Amos and Andy because that was the only... You know, it was a funny show. Yeah. It was a good show. But one of the reasons why the show got snatched was it was the only representation of blacks on the air at that time. Which didn't mean maybe you should have pulled the show off. But maybe there should have been some more shows so you can see. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, like, if I went to see a, a comedy and I saw Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi, I'm not going to say these are the funniest white men that around right you know maybe i'll check out cabinet and see harvey Corman, or maybe you know what i mean mm -hmm. it, and that's what didn't happen for us so that's why that show got pulled and people were taken out of work and so on and so forth but jagger was telling us how that his father related to, to that show as it being real i mean he related to us this is how black people are yeah and jagger grew up and went out and toured and said this is not how black people aren't like that you know but his father dealt with it on that level and that's an example of it you know that's that's an example of it. and i think racism definitely is something that is passed along kids do not grow up and they're little kids playing with each other saying don't play with this kid because he's dirty or don't play with this kid because you know he walks this way or this i think that's something the parents do yeah i think kids you're right kids don't, kids don't think like that yeah kids don't think like that i went to jewish camps all my life i never ever <laughs> ever associated with a kid is a white kid, mm -hmm. a Jewish kid, or why is he wearing a yarmulke? Or why, you know what I mean? Yep. I never did that, man. It was always Ralph, Frank, yeah, Harry, Tom, whatever. It was never my Puerto Rican friend, my wife, and my black friend. <laughs> and I'm glad that my 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 mother brought me up in that kind of environment where I was in private schools and I, you know, and my neighborhood is mixed and stuff. So it was never, and and she, you know, she would have smacked the life out of me if I did relate to somebody like that. Yeah. And that, that's the problem with it. You know, parents get caught up in it. And the fear of it is, you know, it's sad, but the fear of it is the whole concept of blacks and whites or whatever getting along. Because after they get along, people get nervous about them getting married or being together or being happy. And that's when some people can't deal with that. Yeah. You know, like I'm reading Miles' autobiography now. And Miles was talking about how in the 50s when the clubs, they had the clubs in Harlem and the clubs downtown. And when the clubs, when they, all the cats played at the clubs in Harlem, it, it was cool. When, you know, on 52nd Street, they had like three or four clubs lined up. And when cats used to come down there and play, they closed a lot of the clubs down, and they said it was because of the liquor licensing. But Miles said it was really because all of these jazz guys from the Midwest and the East and West Coast were hanging around with the sharp suits on, playing the new music, bebop, and they were hanging out with these white women with money. Yeah. And the white businessmen couldn't deal with that. Mm -hmm. So their their vibe was to can the businesses and say that they need a liquor license and this and that. That's the reality of it. People are afraid of seeing that. People's parents are afraid of somebody coming home. Like that Bensonhurst thing with the, the you know, the white girl going out with a black guy. Yeah. And, and the kids in the neighborhood threatening her, telling them, you better not bring those kind of people in, into this neighborhood. I mean, to think that that's going on now. Today is amazing. You know, yeah. To me, I mean, that whole thing told me in 1989, a black person can be killed because of the color of their skin, because of his race. I wonder sometimes, and maybe I'm real naive on this, I don't think so, but a lot of that stuff like that happened at Bensonhurst and so forth, you know, when the media picks up on that, and I can remember driving up to uh, about 116th Street and making a wrong turn, and there were about five or six black guys in the corner, I'm just sitting around and, and somebody yelling out, hey, white boy, you know, right. and that's just like... Whoa. I mean, there's always, always places like that. There are places where you and I can't go, and there's places where we can go. And sometimes I wonder if the media doesn't do a real disservice by taking one incident that involves six people and blowing it up into either a whole regional yeah. issue or a national issue. Or, you know what I'm saying? Well, the media, when the media get, get, gets a hold of something, usually nine times out of ten, it's destroyed, which is what happened with Tawana Brawley and which yeah. is what happened with when they had, they were passing out these clan uh, rally things in Queens and putting them on car on, on certain people's windows and st um, uh, car windows and stuff in certain neighborhoods and stuff. They 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 take that thing and they really 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 exploit that kind of thing. Um, the thing about the news is supposed to be like an awareness kind of thing, but really there's some subliminal bullshit that goes on with the news that pisses me off 
when a young black youth is caught doing something, they always show his face. They always show him being handcuffed or being taken away. And when it happens with white kids, very rarely will you see these guys being taken away. That's interesting. You just don't see it. And what is that? If I'm a white guy who lives on uh, 96th Street in Central Park West, mm -hmm. and I come home every night and watch the news and I see that, you know, and I don't think about it, what is that going to make me think when I go downstairs and see a black guy walking by? Uh-oh, watch it. Sure. Can I call that man an asshole? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Maybe not. I mean, he's he's reacting to what's being fed to him. And maybe he doesn't have it in his mind to read between the lines. But that's the thing that just pisses me off. The Howard Beach thing, they didn't show those kids for a while. Yep. And, and, and they were like, well, we're not even going to give their names now because they're teenagers. When those other kids, and I'm not, I'm not saying those kids are any better than the kids that raped them in the Central Park. Yeah. But those kids were shown right away. Boom. Yeah. They were on a cover of, of the newspapers for the next four or five days. Hmm. The cover, faces, names, ages. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that, that is a disservice as well. Yeah. And those are the kind of things that sort of just piss me off when I watch the news and I see that. And, you know, it, it's just subliminal. It always happens with ball players and their salaries and their disputes. You don't hear about a lot of problems white ball players have with alcohol and drugs. Yeah. Or, or their wives or them being abusive. You don't, you don't hear about it. Yeah. A black ball player is exploited when that happens. Or yeah. He's making a lot of money now. He can't, he can't handle it. Beating up his wife. He's drinking. Yeah. He's hanging out. And that's happened. Like Keith, Keith Hernandez said this on television. When I had a cocaine problem, nobody made a big deal about it. I, people were trying to get me off cocaine, and I, and I was like, you know, hanging out. Yeah. Saying, yeah, sure. It wasn't a whole big thing. And Dwight Goodman, it was national news. Yeah. You know, and that's the that's the thing that pisses me off. When I know there are, that's happening with a lot of ball plays, the drug testing thing. You know, so it it makes for a bad environment. It makes you see things one sided. Yeah. Amazing. Man, how do we get off on <laughs> my typical drum interview, right? You know, I remember handing an interview I did with Mike Shreve one time at the Ron Spignardi Modern Drummer, and he read through it, and he, and he came in, and he said, Scott, there's nothing in this interview about drums. <laughs> and I, sure there is. You know, you're, you're getting inside Mike Shreve here, you know? Yeah, anyway. Mike's great. Oh, uh, wonderful player. Great guy. Wonderful nice guy. guy, man. I, I met him at the... Um uh, where was that in San Francisco? The radio TV thing. I forgot what that thing is. That it's not, it's not a Grammys thing. I forgot what the um, the thing was called. The award thing was called. Some kind of party they have out there for all the radio and record raps. It'll come. It'll come to me in a second. The okay. Gavin Convention. What is it? The Gavin. The Gavin Convention. Yeah. Okay. I met Tony Williams there. Michael Shreve was there. That Nada Michael Walden was there. A lot of producers. A lot of big label people, big artists come and they meet and they talk. That's where actually that's where I met um, Vanessa Williams and her husband. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. That's where I met her at the Gavin convention. Okay. Yeah. One of my one of my said it. Keep your ears open for a guy named Ed Matthews. When I was a kid, there was a guy. He was the head A and R man at CBS Records when I was a kid. Okay. And he, uh, boy, he was he was just had so, so much of an influence on me. He used to give me records and talk to me. And we just. We, he moved and we uh, lost touch. That's been one of the saddest uh, things in my life because I ended up spending, you know, really my whole life. I'm 38. Uh, I spent up my whole life in the music business. I've always wanted to get in touch with him, you know, and say thank you. You know, he signed up Blood, Sweat, and Tears and worked wow. with Janis Joplin and the Chambers Brothers and all kinds. Of, and he was in the 60s. He was the head A&R guy. And... Uh, Nobody seems to know what happened to him or where he is or something. It's just bizarre, you know, like uh, an angel passing through or something. Yeah, you know? exactly. All right, I'll, I'll check into that. Okay, if you ever hear him, I just, boy, anyway. Where are we here? Tell me about, um, let's see, let's talk about some equipment for a while. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I saw, by the way, your video. That's the first time I saw you guys. I was at the radio station. Guy had MTV on in the other room, so I couldn't hear anything. Okay. And I, all I saw was a picture of you. It looked like you were in high school or something <laughs> yeah. playing, and I said, what? What the hell is this? You know, everyone says you look seventeen. Yeah, it was uh, it was great. So, uh, but then the thing I noticed too, uh, there was a, I guess the, the, it was the video for uh, Cult of Personality. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> and so, so just run it down. Your equipment, why are you using it, what it is? And, okay, uh, um, I'm endorsing Pearl Drums. And um, are those pearls in the video? They're pearls in the video. Um, huh. At the time. Honestly, I wasn't signed 
to contract, but Omar was ringing my phone. I was going through problems with the drum company. I'd rather not mention okay. that um, I used to play, that I used on the record, that really weren't interested in me at all. But basically, um, Gretch. I never, I wasn't Gretch. <laughs> but I heard some wild stories about Gretch. I used Charlie to, told me some wild stories about Gretch. I used to sell drums for Gretch, so go. <laughs> okay. And um, <clears throat> I met this guy named Eric Hall in L.A. And Eric was the original cat that um, talked to me about Pearl Jones. I, I met him, and I, he said, hey, look, I heard you guys are in town. Can I come down? I put him on a guest list, came backstage. And he said, you know, you really should be playing Pearl Jones. And I said, well, I never played Pearl Jones before. And I said, I know I've got, I've got a few friends that are playing him. Tommy Campbell's playing him. Campbell Denard's playing him. You know, yeah. Omar King's playing him. But um, I never, you know, I, I've sat in with those guys, but I never played a Pearl set. And he said, well, I'm going to give you some stuff. Take it home and check it out. I said, okay. Got to New York. He told me to call up the company on the East Coast in Jersey. You know, I spoke to Ray Trigalis, and Ray was the rep, and Ray came down to see us at the Ritz. We opened up for Nona Hendrix. Ray lost his mind. He was like, well, this i never seen anything like this, you know. So he says, look, you know, are you interested in, in, in the drums? And I said, well, look, this is my sound. These are the drums that I really love. This company doesn't want to do diddly, but I... This is my sound. You can get me this or better. That's that's sort of the basis of how that started. Um, I went out to Jersey and played around five or six different kits in the factory. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the maple kits just really sounded great. I took it. I didn't take it back, but I said I want. You know, I like to try this kit. They were very nice to me. Um, they said we would like for you to try out a kit. I was still in the middle of touring in the, in the states, with Living Color, doing the MTV College tour and stuff, and I said. Then we had a video coming up called The Personality, and I didn't want to use the drums that I was using because of the stuff that I went through. So he says, look, how about if you use a pro kit? And I said, well, what if I don't like the drums? And I don't, I go on to, to a different company. Your drums are in the video. I don't, want, I don't know if I want to have that kind of legal commitment. So he says, we're going to get you what you need, promise, da 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 And they were very cool. They said, take this kit out on the road, try it out, and... There, were, there was a, no really no force to sign. I felt like they believed in me as an individual as, as well as the band. Yep. And I told them, fine. I took the kit. I didn't know what I was getting. Those drums just showed up. You didn't, I, know, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't order your own sizes or anything? No. I, well, I told them. They said, what do you need for the video? And I said, you know, just give me a five-piece kit, 22-inch, you know, kick, yep. 13, 14, 16. You know, because it's just a video. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be playing live, but I'll tune them up and, you know, I'll bring my own cymbals down, no problem. I was really interested in their rack system, which is what I'm using now. I got a Sequoia Red set, if you'll see, like, the Landlord video. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a Sequoia Red set, and uh, that's what I took out with, with me on the road. Honestly, the drums sound amazing, but they weren't heavy enough to me. I tried different heads and stuff, and I wanted something that was going to, you know, sound very godlike. And <laughs> this, yeah. this, this Z kit came out, and um, I've been using it since this tour started, and I'm totally pleased with it. So now I'm using the custom Z series uh, Pearl kit. I'm, you know, I have 10, 12, 13, 16, 18, 22 uh, inch kick, which is 18 inches long. Um, I'm using their 8 inch custom Z snare drum, which sounds amazing. And I tell you, I never thought I'd put my brass snare down I lived in you know I ruled with that snare drum yeah. that, was my, that was my snare couldn't take it away from me in a stick up you know um, this snare sounds amazing and it's that brass drum is now my backup drum that's how good this drum sounds what's different about Z series they call it yeah they call it a custom Z series bird's eye maple okay um, it's a beautiful it's a gorgeous looking set that has anything to do with it but I have to say I mean, it looks like furniture. I like to take a time and sit in my living room and put a wine glass on it. <laughs> when you retire, you can always make lamps out of them. Yeah, you know? right. right. Yeah. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put some wine bottles on top of the kitchen. <laughs> you know. But um, it's a gorgeous looking set. It's really, really beautiful, but it's templar. It's very thick, and it's it's very heavy sounding. And what turned me on to the kit was I went to a pearl clinic with Dennis Chambers, Tommy Campbell, Greg Bissonette, and they, they all came out, traded fours, you know what I mean, and, and played funk beats. And... Dennis, by far, was the most phenomenal player, but Greg's sound just crushed everyone's sound to me. I mean, personally, I just felt like his kick and snare was just stomped everyone's sound. And I said, that's what I need. I need that kind of weight. 
So um, I spoke to Ken Austin, actually, who's in town now. We're going to have lunch after this interview. Um, I told Ken that I really dig the kit, and I'd like to take it out in the Stone Store. And what better way to sell a new kit than to take it out and tour and play in front of 60,000 people a night, you know? Mm-hmm. And I love the drums. They sound really, really amazing. But this, the red kit was great. You know what I mean? It was really, really good. It was a good kit. It sounded good. I got my personality out of it, but I had to fight. This kit, I feel this is me. And I'm happy to be with this company, and I'm happy to be playing these drums because this sound is the sound, my sort of future sound that I'm leaning towards, mm-hmm. getting getting to. Any electronic stuff at all? Yeah, could? I have a uh, drum cat, which is an amazing sampling unit. I used to use the Octopad, and I use the drum cat now because you can get up to three sounds on one pad, mm-hmm. and there's ten pads instead of eight. And you, you, you control the whole switching and program changing and stuff with foot switches, which I stick next to my hi-hat. And you can change your programs by hitting the pad in between songs. So you don't have to get up or jump around and do, you know what I mean? You yeah. just go click, 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 and you're there and change. I'm using the drum cat, and that's running through an S1000, a Kai S1000 sampler. Mm-hmm. And that's as far deep into the electronics as I've, as I've gone. I, I like my acoustic live sound. I have people leaning on me now about using samples since we're playing big stadiums, but I'm sorry, I'm just not into it. Yeah, what are you using samples of? Uh, live? Yeah. Oh, on the uh, drum cat? Yeah. The Malcolm speeches in the beginning are called Personality. Yep. I have some horn hits, some orchestra hits. I have some samples we used from Jagger when he was working with us in the studio producing Glamour Boys and um, Which Way to America. He has, I have the sample of him saying, okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. But it's very English sounding. Oh, hey, okay. Kate. It's like, okay, here you go. Yeah. Okay, you know, it sounds really, really, <laughs> yeah. It sounds pretty funny. So I take things like that, cartoon things. Um, uh, I have a couple of things in my M1 with a transfer because I have some ideas I want to use for the next tour we do on our own, our own headlining tour. And I want to incorporate some of my keyboard playing and some of my sounds and stuff into my sort of open drum solos and make the open drum solo a big sort of orchestral African song. <laughs> yeah, okay, so using digital samples. Using digital samples, using triggers, using sequences. Okay. And using my live set. I'm still putting it all together, but um, I think if I can get it to where I'm at least thinking about it now, it could be pretty amazing. So that's my dream right now to focus on that. When this tour's over and we'll start, we've already started writing. We already have a lot of material for the next album, but I really, really want to spend a lot of time practicing, incorporating that. Mm-hmm. That's basically all that I'm using for now. I don't have any drum sounds coming out of that. Okay. Out of that unit. And I do have a Roland R8. And if I needed to take anything out, I would possibly pull some things out of there that I want to use. I want to maybe get like a reverse kick drum and stuff to just use Mm -hmm. to add to my original sounds. But to me, and this is just my own personal opinion, you know, that if you have a great engineer, you have good drums and a good drum sound, good microphones, you can get a good drum sound. Mm-hmm. may not be what you got on the album, may not be what you consider to be a perfect drum sound. To each his own. You know, management was leaning on me about getting it. I'm, I'm not into it. I'm just not into it. And I spent too much time on technique and stuff. They just were talking about it with, with me, and I, I felt like that was a jive approach. Really what happened was on, on our tour before this, we were touring the States, and we played in Florida or somewhere, somewhere. I think it was in Florida. Mm-hmm. And uh, David Lee Roth's sound man showed up at Soundcheck. And he walked behind my kit and he said, you tune your drum. <laughs> and I said, yes, I tune my drum. He goes, that sound that I just heard out in the house is your kit. And I said, yeah, it takes a little while sometimes, but basically this is it. And he shook his head. And I was like, what's the matter with you? And he said, we, we trigger everything, you know, we trigger toms and stuff. So it's consistent every night, so we don't have to spend time on this. And I said, I hear that, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how you do your tour. That's that's great. Management was like, I after that happened, the management were like, well, you know, well, you should think about that. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not into it, you know. Yeah, it's too cheesy. They want everybody, everybody to sound the same, you know. Yeah. Man. I'm not into it. Get a, get a kick-ass sound, man, and work. Pay to work. Everybody work. It doesn't really take that much longer to me. Yeah. It really doesn't. It's, uh, I think that's a very Java, Java approach to me. 
I'm not saying the David Lee Roth approach is a jive approach to getting drum sounds. Don't I don't want you to like misquote me on that. Yeah. But for me in Living Color, it's a jive approach. It's only four of us on stage. There's no need for that. Mm-hmm. I want the drums to sound the way they sound when I tune them. That's what I want people to hear. For, you know, if it needs a little EQ or beefing up, whatever behind a board, do it. Fine. Yeah. But um, I'm not going to sample toms and kick drums and just use those. Now, switching, mixing and matching is something interesting that I, that I might get into. Maybe what is that? For, for, well, maybe for a heavier song or a lighter <laughs> song, you may want to get a rinky dink <laughs> toy, snare drum sound. Okay. You may want to stick in for like four or eight bars of a funk song and then kick in your regular kit. Things like that, yeah. I think, are slick. Yep. That's great. Or throwing in different size kick drum thing, you know. But to substitute my whole kit is like, you know, I might as well be up there playing pads. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's it's the same thing. I might as well just be up there beating on rubber pads. I'm not into it. You can get you get a rinky dink snare drum. You could be the Roy. You ever see Roy Brooks play? No. <laughs> he used to have a lot of great. He, he had the first. Uh, he used to have um, rubber hoses. That, yeah. Did you ever see that done? Yeah. Yeah. When you know you blow into the drums and whoop, raise the pitch yeah. and lower the pitch. Yeah. He was one. I saw with Mingus playing. It was laughing. I mean, he was great. Everything he did was musical. And maybe somebody could resurrect that in rock and roll. Yeah. You know? So I, I try to keep myself connected to, to the roots of it. Like when. We were touring on our own, and I would take open drum solos. People would always ask me, you know, you play a lot of African stuff. You play a lot of, you know, time changes and stuff, and you incorporate that into rock and roll. And people say, wow, that's a great thing. And I'm like, well, it's connected. Really, it's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just a different side of it. That used to be the part of the show that I really used to love, of course, because it gave me a chance to totally be me. Mm -hmm. I mean, totally just get away from black rock and I mean we're all not into that for people labeling us we're not into being a black rock band but even to step off from rock music you know some nights I would just play a straight up jazz solo you would? yep 